for those who seek adventure, this is the Buffalo Roamer Podcast, sharing the people, places, and moments that make a life on the loose worth living. The thing that's going to stick out to you most is when they open up that plane door. The cold is something like you've never felt. The jungle is so thick. Even if you had a machete, you couldn't get through it. There's a huge blonde grizzly bear. And when it saw us, this thing put its head down, stomped on the ground, and hissed like an alligator. I just crossed this real stretch of desert and I was really suffering. I'm your host, Will Collins. I'm an adventurer, outdoorsman, and roamer of wild places. I've backpacked the Brooks Range, rafted the Grand Canyon, and have canoed from source to sea both the Mississippi and Yukon rivers. I live for adventure, travel, fresh air, and diving into the unknown. And now, I hope to share my passion with you on the Buffalo Roamer Podcast. Here we go, episode 84. Appreciate you tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe and follow wherever you're listening and share the podcast with a friend if you enjoy it. I got a great show lined up for you today. A couple things to tell you about first is that I have 2024 Buffalo Roamer Wilderness Canoe Trips, fully guided and outfitted. Uh, Dates are out at buffaloroamer.com backslash trips and including a new one this year that I'm really excited about on the mighty Mississippi, which is what we're going to be talking a decent amount about here on this podcast, uh, on this episode. Uh, In July 26th through the 29th, 2024 is the date on that Mississippi River Bluff Country Canoe Trip near La Crosse, Wisconsin. We'll be paddling the Mississippi River for four beautiful days through some of the most beautiful hilly and bluff country sections of the river. Uh, Really excited for that one. BuffaloRumor.com backslash trips. Also have trips growing to the Green River in Utah, as well as Wisconsin River, Lower Wisconsin River here in the Midwest. A lot of great and cool trips. BuffaloRumor.com. Check that out. Today's podcast is brought to you by Fischel Paddles, makers of fine handcrafted wooden canoe paddles. Check them out at fischelpaddles.com, F-I-S-H-E-L-L. Also brought to you by SRE Outdoors and SREgear.com, family-owned and operated outdoor gear shop in Black River Falls, Wisconsin, SREgear.com. And you can use the code WILL to save at both of those uh, sponsors and sites. Uh, today's podcast is an awesome one. Dan Faust is on the pod. Dan is a through paddler. He is uh, in the recent film and documentary called Greybeard, The Myth, The Man, The Mississippi. He is a Mississippi through paddler. He's paddled the river twice. Plans to paddle the Missouri River in 2024 through paddle. And he is also a fellow Illinoisan like myself uh, and has paddled many of the same uh, little small local rivers and creeks in our area and in our uh, great state here of Illinois, the Prairie State. So without further ado, episode 84, Dan Faust on Buffalo Roamer Outdoors. All right, rocking and rolling on another episode of Buffalo Roamer Outdoors, and I'm uh, pleased to be joined by Dan Faust, uh, former Illinoisan, former or not a former, a fellow, I should say, and uh, a through paddler as well. So I'm really excited to chat with you. How you doing, Dan? I'm doing good. That's good. I'm, uh, yeah, excited to hear about your river trips and uh, uh, a lot to talk about. So. I guess if you want to start, give me a little uh, rundown of who you are and uh, your story with the outdoors and then just like a little resume of, uh, of your paddling and, and uh, outdoor adventures. Uh, yeah, I'm just an average uh, recreational paddler. I started paddling uh, in 1969 to join the Boy Scouts and uh, they had a 100 mile canoe trip on the Spoon River. Uh, and I'm not sure where we started, but I do know we ended up, uh, very near the Illinois river, uh, down by Havana, Illinois. Uh, and, uh, I've just been hooked on canoeing ever since I eventually, uh, started kayaking as well. Um, there's something special about rivers. I just, you know, they're dynamic. They're always changing and I love rivers. Um, lakes, lakes are fun, but, uh, my thing is really kayaking on rivers. And so I, I've been doing it ever since, um, my wife and I got married in 1981 and a few years later we bought our first canoe. Um, she was in Girl Scouts. I was in Boy Scouts. We both like to paddle and camp and all that. So, uh, bought our first canoe and uh, that was a lot of fun, but uh, my wife got a job where she was working a lot of weekends and stuff, 
And I started paddling by myself in that, uh, you know, tandem canoe, Grumman canoe. And I get out and I get on a windy day. And there was a few times I couldn't even paddle downstream. The wind was so uh, fierce coming upstream. Um, it, you know, it's ridiculous. So I decided I needed something smaller and more maneuverable. And I found a, an old fiberglass kayak for sale. I think it was like 50 bucks, something really cheap. So I picked that up and, you know, on like a, a pl- big old plastic paddle must have weighed five pounds. And that's how I started out. Um, not long after that, I decided I really needed to get find a, a paddling club. And I searched around, searched around, and I finally found the Mackinac Canoe Club. And, you know, I had quite a bit of paddling experience before that. Um, Boy Scouts taught me a lot, but uh, I hadn't had much formal training since the Boy Scouts. And when I got into the Mackinac Canoe Club, I really started getting an education in uh, how to paddle and uh, canoe camping and, you know, kind of some of the tips and tricks and ways to do things right, be a little more efficient or a little safer, things like that. So they're, they're a great club. Um, and I probably paddled with them for 15 or 20 years and we would go year round, you know, it, we never had an off season. Uh, I had a dry suit and, uh, you know how it is. You never have enough boats. You always need one more. <laughs> um, so, you know, just, just started paddling all the time, collecting equipment and doing more stuff, uh, dabbled in whitewater for a while. I was never very good at whitewater, uh, but I wanted to paddle on the Vermilion River over here at Wildcat. And I did that a few times. Um, that was fun. But, you know, that's class two, class three, not a big deal. Sure. Uh, that was that's, that's about the limit of my whitewater skills and experience. And how did you, uh, how and when, and also, I don't know if you're maybe clicking a pen or something, but I'm uh, picking it up on the mic. Sorry. Um, no problem. Uh, how did you transition from, uh, you know, the... Uh, not shorter trips, but weekend trips, maybe longer trips. And where, where did the uh, Mississippi start to come into play? And, and what's your Mississippi and Big River history? Well, the vast majority of my experience, uh, just my own paddling and then paddling with the canoe club and, you know, friends and this and that, uh, almost exclusively on small rivers and streams. Um you know, the Vermilion here in Pontiac's not very big, maybe, you know, 75, 50 to 75 feet across for most of the, the time. And uh, it's not not necessarily a super deep river. Um, so that's what I mostly did. Um, and, and it was a lot of fun. Um, we They had a group of guys that uh, kind of like to go on on, little sections and little streams where nobody else usually went. Um, had a couple guys had the Illinois Gazetteer and they would like to mark off all the little blue lines that they had paddled, you know, and they're really kind of, I think a couple of them had a goal of uh, marking off every one of those blue lines in Illinois. That's a lot of rivers and streams, but a lot, a lot of those are, uh, you know, they've got deadfalls and uh, log jams and, maybe a few beaver dams here and there. And uh, at first I thought, this is crazy, man. This is, you know, who wants to paddle out here? But then it kind of got to be fun and uh, we got pretty good at it. And uh, so I really didn't, I didn't ever, I never went over to the Illinois. I never paddled that, never had any uh, really inclination to paddle on the Missouri or the Mississippi or anything like that. And, uh, we, my wife and I heard about canoe copia up in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm sure you're familiar with that every, uh, March, you know, the big deal up there. And we were up there, Oh, must've been mid to late eighties. 
And uh, one of the first years, I think we, we went up there and they had all these presentations. You know, I was up there. I thought it was just going to be a shopping trip. And then I found out, wow, when you pay a fee to get in, then you have access to all these people who do incredible trips and uh, you sit and listen to them and they'll show you a nice little slideshow or a movie and talk about the trips they've done. So there was a guy there named Byron Curtis. Uh, he's from Wisconsin. He was a school teacher and uh, a recreational paddler. And he just decided one summer while he was off, he would paddle a Mississippi from his hometown right there, uh, St. Croix River, and just take it from there and go all the way to the Gulf. And he wrote a little book called Bluffs to Bayous. He gave a great presentation, as you can imagine, a school teacher would, you know, very comfortable and uh, making a presentation and speaking in front of people. Super nice guy. And that kind of planted the seed. And uh, I got the book, I read it, and it was always in the back of my mind, you know, someday I'm, I want to do that. And then uh, one thing led to another and I got retired and I decided that's what I'm going to do. That's great. And so it's interesting. I, I, I did the river in uh, so much that you've said already. I, I want to like dive back into, but I want to hear more about your trips. Uh, uh, we'll circle back, but I got some stories about the Vermilion River and, and uh, paddling lakes and, and or not lakes, but all the streams and rivers in Illinois uh, here as well. Um, but I paddled the river in 2017. I did a source to see on the Mississippi or 2016. And uh, you don't talk to people who've done it twice very often. And mm -hmm. so that's an interesting perspective of uh, doing two trips because you did a source to see in 2021 and then the 2022 trip uh, with Dale Sanders as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've had kind of a blessed life. Uh, it just seems like so many things just fall in my lap like this. And uh, so I started preparing about 18 months in advance for my 2021 trip. It was really supposed to be a 2020 trip. And then COVID came along and I got kind of freaked out. And I said, I'm just going to postpone a year. There was so many variables and so many unknowns. And, you know, I, they started out saying, you know, maybe this will be over by summer and, and all that stuff. And then it became apparent that that wasn't going to happen. And so anyway, I just decided that if there was uh, any chance whatsoever that my trip might cause someone else to become ill or even die, then I just didn't want any part of that. I was just going to wait and see what happened. And, and uh, sure enough, you know, in the next year, things had kind of uh, settled out a little bit. We kind of knew what we were dealing with, and I was a little more sure about what was going on. And that 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 trip, that first trip I did up by myself, uh, it just blew me away. You know, you, you expect things to go wrong. You expect there to be problems and difficulties and hardships and what. So, you know, one thing and another, and it, it just, there was very little hardships or very little uh, difficulties. Um, you know, I mentioned I paddled all those little rivers and streams and creeks and, and stuff, and that was kind of just what we did for years and years and years, and I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. When you get up in the headwaters, Lake Itasca from there to Bemidji is about 50, 55 miles. And for a lot of people, that's the toughest part of the whole trip. It is difficult. It's small and there's just a lot of challenges. There's uh, beaver dams and deadfalls and log jams and strainers and uh, a lot of twists and turns. And you'll come to a place and it gets real marshy and, and the river widens out. It's kind of a pond type of a situation and later in the summer that gets all overgrown and you just can't tell where the water's going and uh i had just no problems with any of that stuff because i've dealt with all that for so many years i didn't know it but it was kind of like i was training for that trip the whole sure. time uh for years and years 
And then, you know, there's the bugs and everything. And I don't know what it was that year, but, and I'm a guy that I wear long pants all the time. I never, I don't wear shorts. I never do. Not since I was a kid. And, uh, as I've gotten older, I've realized I need to protect myself from the sun. So I just like long sleeve sun shirt with a hood, a wide brimmed hat, gloves, you know, the whole works. I didn't have much exposed skin, um, but I would get into camp in a lot of places. You know, there were places up in Minnesota where there were mosquitoes and what have you, um, especially when you got up into camp away from the river. But it wasn't bad until, you know, it'd get about dusk when the mosquitoes always come out and mm-hmm. I duck into my, my hammock and, you know, with the bug net and I was fine. And, and I got, what time, down, what, time uh, what time of year did you do your, the two trips and, uh, and how long were, were each of them? The first trip uh, solo, I started on May 29th and it took me 64 days. In 2022 with Dale, we started on June the 14th because that's Dale's birthday. And we took 87 days. Uh, I think it was about the 8th of September we finished. Okay. So I want to, I want to dive into both of these trips as we're, we already are, but, uh, set up your second trip with Dale because I know, cause I followed along, but, uh, uh, who is he? What, what, what was the goal? And obviously there's a film about that trip that's out now. Yep. Well, for those of you who don't know, Dale Sanders goes by the trail name of Graybeard. And in 2015, I believe. Yeah. 2015, Dale decided, you know, after living a long life, he was already 80 years old he decided he wanted to start doing some adventure trips. And so he paddled the entire Mississippi River. Him and his good friend, Richard Sojourner, uh, did the whole river together. And I should interject quickly as well uh, that uh, Dale was on this podcast, I think about two years ago we had him on. uh, I forget what episode it was, but if you're listening and interested, go back and check it out because that's a great one. It was well before uh, the trip with you. I think it was relatively yeah. soon after his uh, his first Mississippi River trip. But all right, keep 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 her going. Yeah, and Dale's a super interesting guy. So he did that, and he set the age record at 80 years old. Um, and I don't know what who had the record before that. Uh, maybe Verling Kruger or somebody like that. But it really wasn't. Uh, you know, anywhere near 80 years old. No one else had done anything like that. And uh, in the meantime, Dale, after that, he I think the next year he did the Grand Canyon, did rim to rim to rim, and he still holds that record. That's um, a brutal still, one. Yeah, but he actually, he said it was pretty easy. You know, I did a rim to rim a year or two before my Mississippi River trip, and I... Like Dale, I just trained a heck off myself for that. I lost about uh, 50 pounds getting ready for that. So it really, it wasn't that bad. Of course, you know, I took four days and it's only 23 miles. But he did his in about seven, six or seven days. And he did rim to rim to rim. So he did twice what I did. And he said it was a piece of cake. That was the easiest <laughs> record he's got. So it's, uh, it's kind of surprising. But if you prepare properly, and Dale is like an expert backpacker. Um, as you can imagine, uh, the next year after the rim to rim to rim, he did the Appalachian trail and he set the age record on the Appalachian trail. And so, uh, for three years, Dale held both records, both age records simultaneously, never been done before. And probably there's no one else will even have an opportunity to do that unless they're, you know, somebody like Dale, uh, just a phenomenon, you know, a freak of nature, but uh, pretty impressive. So then I started doing my research for my 2020 trip. And of course, I found out about Dale and I was just blown away. And of course, instantly, I'm a fan of Dale Sanders and started looking up everything I could find on him and and reading about it. And I found out that Dale has a wall in his house the wall going down to his basement 
in that stairway is kind of a, a long winding stairway. People came through and they would, Dale's a river angel as well in Memphis. And they'd stay with Dale and they would sign the wall. As they're paddling and, through on their uh, Mississippi river trip. Yeah. Make a record of their, their trip down the river. And I think it started out as a record of uh, the people that stayed with Dale. And he's got, he's got, you know, every name you can imagine that's done the Mississippi river. Uh, is, is your name on there, Will? It's not on there. No, I you missed it when I went through. Yeah, it's a shame. Right. Yeah, it was pretty early. So I don't even know if the if the wall was going yet when you went through. But uh, so, of course, that was a goal right off the bat. Man, I want to get my name on that wall. I mean, you don't. I don't really feel like my name belongs up there with some of those legendary <laughs> names. But I thought, hey, if he'll let me sign it, what the heck? You know, that'd be something to really brag about. So I did that. I uh, contacted Dale and he, he arranged to have me uh, picked up and brought to his house. And uh, on your train, you're stopping, you're stopping Memphis, I would guess, just judging probably day what, probably like 40 or 50 or something along those lines, maybe earlier. Yeah, it, it would have been, yeah, right in there, late 40s, early 50s. Yeah. The trip actually goes pretty quick after that. You know, the river's free flowing, at least for me. And I was, I was moving along pretty good that year, but, uh, Dale, so then I, I, you sign it and he said, you know, well, don't put the, your ending date on there. Cause we don't know it yet. And, uh, he said, when you come back through going home, you know, of course I'm coming back up to Illinois. It worked out good for me and going right by there. He said, just stop in again and, and finish it off and we'll get to visit some more. And he mentioned, he says, you know, uh, I lost my Mississippi River age record uh, last year. Uh, now I can't say the name of the man that took it from him. Uh, super guy. Him was and it, Dale are friends. Uh, it's not Stan something, is it? Yeah, Stan Stark. Thank you. Stark? Yeah, Stan Stark. Yeah. Yep. Uh, unfortunately, Stan's passed away now. But Stan was just a great guy, too. Uh, I got the message back and forth with him on Facebook and stuff. And I always wanted to meet him. I thought I'd have plenty of time to do that someday. And uh, unfortunately, Stan suddenly passed away. But Dale was saying, you know, Stan took my record and I'm going to get it back next year. I say, like, wow, OK. He goes, yeah, I'm trying to put together a bunch of river angels and people to you know support me and help me out. And he said, I'm really trying to get a hold of my right hand man, Matt Briggs, but he's out on the uh, Continental Divide Trail and didn't have cell service. And he was like weeks at a time. You, you couldn't even call him. And so I said, well, you know, if you're looking, oh, he kind of almost jokingly, I said, if you're looking for paddlers, I'll paddle with you. And we both kind of laughed about it. And then on the way back through uh, going home, stopped in with my wife and my daughter and everybody got to meet Dale again. And, uh, kind of reinforced it. I said, Hey, are you, you know, did you get a hold of Matt? And he said, yeah, I got a hold of Matt, but we were probably going to add one or two more paddlers. And I said, well, you know, uh, I'm ready to go. If, You're if, fresh if, off a trip, feeling great after just finishing it and yeah. just high on life. I have to assume. Yeah. Well, you know, and I am kind of, uh, a little bit obsessed with paddling. I had told my family that, my dream would be to paddle the river twice in one year. I don't think anyone's ever done that. And so I told them before the trip even started, my very first trip, I said, if the conditions are right, when I finish, I want to go right back up to Bemidji or right up back up to Lake Itasca and do it again. And I, I was serious. I would, I would have done that, You're but animal. it was, it was a low water year and it was, you know, nobody was being able to, make that first 50 miles. And I didn't want to do it if I couldn't do the whole thing. I didn't want to have to start at Bemidji or Portage around a bunch of stuff. So it didn't work out, but that was just all the more fuel that, you know, start bugging Dale, let him make, you know, get him to let me go with him. And eventually he did. Uh, we had miscommunications and misunderstandings. He wasn't sure I was 
serious about going back out the next year. Uh, but absolutely I was. And I just thought, what have I got to lose? You know, I, don't, I didn't think he would, uh, he'd want me to go with him, but, uh, in, in, in a way too, I told him just recently, we were talking about it. Um, I, I, I told my wife, I says, you know, it's a free world. I'll just show up. I know when he's leaving, <laughs> you know, and it's like, Hey, you know, hey, I might we not be, be doing the trip at the same time. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. what a coincidence, you know, I might not be officially part of your team, but uh, uh, yeah, I'm just here I can uh, at least witness history, you know, that's funny. But uh, yeah, he let me become part of the team. And I mean, it just blows that's my so mind that. But show, break down the team if you can for me and exactly the production, because that's quite the, uh, quite the opposite. I would have to imagine uh, in some aspects uh, of doing the trip solo your first time. And then with Dale, with Dale, uh, a larger crew also yeah. shooting a movie. I'd be interested to hear about yeah. all that. Yeah, we had quite, we had a kind of an entourage there for a while. Um, so yeah, I mean, people ask me about that. What, how do the two trips compare? And I say it, it might as well have been on two different rivers because it, they were completely different trips, completely different experiences, and honestly, uh, two absolutely fantastic experiences. I'm so lucky. I I couldn't ask for anything better. And you know. After my first trip, it went so amazingly well that it was almost sad because I wanted, I knew I wanted to do the river again someday, uh, you know, just even on my own, even if it hadn't been for Dale. And there would be no way a trip would probably ever live up to that first trip. It was just so perfect. It, it, there's no way that could happen twice, you know. <laughs> And then uh, going with Dale, I mean, I did I had, he said there's going to be a, a film crew and he kind of told us who it was going to be and everything. Of course, I'd never met him. Uh, well, I, I had, I had met Zach Rivers um, just briefly at Canoe Copia that spring before the trip. But, uh, you know, I didn't know any of these people. I didn't really even know Dale. Um, I heard of Matt Briggs and, message back and forth with him a little bit, but I didn't know any of the, any of these folks. So, and you know, people ask me was, was it what you expected? And I said, I, I didn't know what to expect. I didn't have any expectations whatsoever. And I had no understanding of what it was like to make a movie, what would go into that. I didn't understand my role in the whole thing. Um, and what was, of, what was your role? What did it come to be? Well, as far as the movie goes, you know, it just you have to have some supporting cast and they're looking for, you know, stories or anecdotes or input or things to help tell the story. And uh, it was interesting because, you know, as time went on, we knew what they were filming uh, at first. Matt and I would just try to stay out of the way, not be in the shot, you know, didn't want to ruin anything. We didn't want to photo bomb anybody, but uh, then they would come to us and say, Oh, we need to do an interview interview. What, what are you talking about? Yeah. We're going to set you down here in a chair, put a camera on you. We're going to start asking you questions. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> no idea what the questions were going to be. Um, and I was super nervous and, but, you know, so we, we see what they're doing uh, eventually. Um, and we're kind of like, what, what, I wonder what they're going to do with that. And we really didn't have a good clue. Uh, we thought it was going to be just a documentary about this record setting trip. And that would have been okay. But uh, actually the movie is just more of a, the, the, Trip is a backdrop to tell the story of Dale's life and some of the things that he's accomplished and really how he hopes to inspire people with his story. And it is very inspiring. It's amazing. It's I, I can't wait to see it. And I'm, I'm uh, ashamed to say I haven't seen it yet. I know it's been out for a while. And uh, uh, what's it called? It's called Greybeard, Myth, the Man, the Legend. And where can people see it or can they? 
Um, I believe it's on Amazon Prime right now. And of course, you can go to the website, uh, Graybeard, the man, the myth, the Mississippi uh, dot com. Um, just do a right. search for Graybeard, the man, yeah. the myth, the Mississippi, and it'll come up and you can buy a, a copy. Uh, you can get it on a DVD or you can do a digital streaming. And so what uh, I, I kind of interjected there, but what uh, how did it come together and what was your you know, how did you see it come together with being a part of it, but not understanding uh, the production uh, actually of the film? Because obviously that's not obviously, but that's a, a whole separate thing than just doing the trip is trying to create this uh, story and product that uh, kind of lives beyond the trip. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they they shoot hundreds and hundreds of hours of uh I don't know, film. I don't know if it's really, it's not really film, but you know, it's all digital footage or I not footage anymore. Either. I don't know what you call it, but they, they, they shoot a lot of scenes, a lot of, of stuff. They record a lot of, of what we're doing and all these uh, interviews seem like every time they show up, then we do a whole series of interviews after the, we got done paddling that day. And uh, so the, our first glimpse of it was at the very end. And they worked, I mean, it was funny. They all had this plan to do the trip in 87 days because he was 87 years old. So he was 87 years and 87 days old when we finished the trip and in the Gulf it, of Mexico. To put it in a bit of context as well, I was, uh, what was I, how old was I here? 20, maybe 23, 24, something like that, 23. And I did it in 103 days. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, and that's, that's cool. Um, every trip's different, you know. And but take but I'm just saying, yeah, to put it in context, 87 yeah. to 80 days or 87 to 87 years old is just insane. Yeah. It's, 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 it is. Yeah. I mean, I was there and I still can't hardly believe it. I, you know, I got to pinch myself. Uh, he did incredibly well. He had some, we all struggled at times, but uh, he's a trooper. I mean, it's just like the Energizer Bunny he just keeps on going. But we so in order to finish at 87 days, we actually got to Venice, Louisiana, uh, three days early. And that was kind of the plan, too. Dale wanted to take a break. He loves that area and he just wanted to hang out for three days. And uh, I forgot what I was going to tell you now. It's all right. It happens to me all the time. <laughs> yeah. But uh, um, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. And how, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I know what I was going to tell you. The, okay, the, uh, those, for those three days, the camera crew, the film crew, whatever the, they worked almost nonstop putting together the trailer for the movie. We didn't even know what the title of the movie was going to be. So after they all completed the trip and we finished, uh, noonish on that 87th day, went back to the, my little bed and breakfast or hotel we were staying at, and they had a, a big uh, party. Um, lots of food and music, live music, and uh, all kinds of stuff going on. And the culmination of the whole thing was a preview, a debut of the name and the movie trailer. And that's when we got our first glimpse at what it was going to be. And then... So that's in September. And that's when you, uh, when you kind of understood the, uh, uh, I guess, professional quality of it. Right. Or, or oh, what, absolutely yeah. totally blew me away. These, these folks are really professionals. Um, you know, uh, they're young and they're starting out s small. They don't have, you know, a huge bunch of money behind them and, a big production crew and all that. This is uh, bare bones, shoestring budget, and uh, had to had to raise funds along the way so they could keep uh, filming and recording. But uh, yeah, top notch. I mean, that's awesome. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, and then we didn't really see them any more of it. We didn't really know fully understand what 
exactly the movie was going to be until January the next year. And uh, the movie debuted at the Lookout Wild Film Festival in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And we were all there for that. Man, I, this blew me away. Hmm. And how, uh, what, what are the differences or what, how did you find the differences between uh, just being solo and being in the group? Well, that's an interesting thing too. Um, my first trip, I and also, kinda, what what were you paddling? Uh, both trips for me, I paddled a Wilderness Systems Tsunami 145, which is kind of a short boat uh, as far as sea kayaks by by most people's standards. The, the 14 and a half foot boat worked really, really well up in the headwaters because it's so small and twisty and turny. Um, and that particular boat, will just haul a ton of gear. It's very, it's got a lot of volume inside. So that, that worked out great. It's a great boat. It tracks well, easy to handle, the stable, got, got decent speed, decent efficiency. Um, and I, and I paddled it both years about halfway through the trip with Dale, my second trip with that boat, I said, if I do this again, I'm going to have a longer boat, though. Because I did, yeah, I, I definitely kind of got tired of that, uh, you know, big open water in that s- smallish boat. But it it, it did it. Um, Dale and Matt each had a um, North Wind solo, which is about a... 15 or 16 foot solo canoe, open canoe. And those boats handled phenomenally. I was really surprised uh, how well, how dry they were for one thing, some of the big water we were in. And uh, yeah, those, those are really good boats. That's great. And how about the, uh, the difference or, or, yeah, the, b- between doing a trip that long in a group and uh, doing it solo. Well, I wanted to do, go solo the first year when I was by myself. I had people ask if they could go with me. I had people offer to join and help, you know, kind of lead me through it. And I, I really wanted to do it on my own. I wanted to prove to myself that I really could do it by myself. And, uh, but it, it didn't exactly turn out the way I thought it would. I had so much support, ground support from my family and from River Rangers and stuff like that. Uh, I look back through my blog and it it averaged out to about once every five days. I was either in a hotel with my family or I was at a River Rangel. So, yeah, you know, I did the trip solo, but it. Yeah, it wasn't really all that difficult when you're only out there on an average of five days at a time. It's um, amazing uh, the people who pop up along the way who you meet, isn't it? I, I it, that's yeah. always my biggest takeaway when people ask is, you know, yeah, you go I in think thinking, been, yeah. I think I benefited from the long preparation time because it was about two and a half years before from the time I started to the time I actually did the trip um, with the COVID delay in there for a year. So I was on the Facebook Mississippi River Paddlers page and the Mississippi River Angels page quite a bit. And people knew my name and they, you know, I had my picture out there. They knew what I looked like. I'd done a few videos so they could look at those and really kind of see and hear what I was like. And I had River Angels just coming out of the woodwork want you know make an offering to put me up for the night and feed me and you know just do all the wonderful things they do for you do my laundry and let me have their shower and all that and uh i really i could only take advantage of just a fraction of the people that offered to help me out Um, and that was another great thing about going with dale uh the very next year i got to meet a lot of the river angels and a lot of the folks that i had to kind of skip over and i didn't I didn't get to meet uh, the first year. So that was, that was a lot of fun in and of itself. And, you know, it was very rewarding to, 
know that and it gave me a lot of confidence in my paddling and my outdoor skills to know that I, I did do what I did on my own. Um, what I have to say is rewarding and as fantastic as that first trip was, going with a group was, in my mind, a bigger accomplishment and much more satisfying, much more rewarding. Uh, you know, and you're, you're all pulling together for a common cause. And for us, it was really uh, a specific thing. You know, we were out there just to help Dale to try to do anything we could to get him down the river. And, you know, you, you can't, you can't push him or pull him or help him along. He has to do it himself, but you can be there and encouraging him. And when he gets off the river, you know, anything he needs, get him some food or, or whatever we can to help him. We can do that. And we did. And so everybody, definitely, that was our whole focus and uh, when everybody's pulling for the one one goal like that, it's it's a really rewarding situation, and uh, we really came close together that group. And I that was the thing I hated the most getting off the river. I knew I wasn't going to see them guys anymore. Right. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And yeah, you get to know somebody. I always tell people. Uh, you know, you, you really get to know somebody on a camping trip, you know, whether it's a weekend or uh, four days, five days or 87 days. There's no hiding out there when you're with somebody 24 seven and elements are out. Things are going wrong. Um, you know, you can hide a little bit in, in normal life, you know, when you're comfortable and you can fake it for a bit. But man, out out in the woods. uh it's tough to fake it for too long. You really get to know people well, don't you? Yes, you do. And you see each other at some of your highs and lows. Um, you know, maybe not necessarily see the worst in a person or at their worst, but, uh, you know, everybody, you're not always at your best. And uh, the trip wears on you after a while. Uh, it's hot or it's cold and buggy and it's, you know, sun beating down on you and you're hungry and you're tired and, uh, you know, things add up and eventually, uh, you know, there were, there was going to be conflicts, but, uh, thankfully, you know, these guys are all experienced and just absolutely such wonderful people that after, after we had our, our, our little conflicts and stuff it would come together and everybody kind of make up and apologize and we were even closer afterwards so it uh it really worked out well you know and i i read all that i could about these long distance trips i i did every i read everything i could about the mississippi and then i started reading about like the appalachian trail and things like that and a lot of times when groups start out together they don't all end together very and true. The three of us stuck together the whole time and even picked up another really fantastic team member along the way. And, you know, like I said, we finished even stronger than what we started out like. So I was, yeah. that's, to me, that's the proudest thing I could say about the whole experience is that, you know, we all still get along. We, we started out friendly and we ended up really close friends. That's great. So, um, doing the river twice. Do you have a favorite section of the mighty yeah. Mississippi? Yeah. Uh, people ask me that and I've kind of touched on it already. I'm weird. I like the headwaters. It's so beautiful. It's so it wild. Christine, I, I, agree. Um, I saw uh, river otters I had never seen in the wild before. Um, I'd seen some mink and things like that up in Wisconsin, but, uh, the river otters, and of course, there's, there's bald eagles everywhere up there now. Uh, we even have a few here in Illinois, but I mean, they were just like you'd see half a dozen almost every day. Just all the wildlife, the deer and uh, sandhill crane. I'd never been up close to a sandhill crane before. I got really close to a couple of them. And uh, yeah, I saw ducks and things. I, I have no. A clue what they what uh, what their names were, what, what type of ducks they were. They were beautiful. 
things I'd never seen before. And you'd see it all the time. Yeah. Uh-huh. And it's, it's funny too, thinking about it. I always love showing people, uh, uh, in some of the presentations I do, I have the photo of, uh, you know, day one after Itasca and I happen to do it on a <clears throat> lower water year and, you know, going through those rice, uh, wild rice swamps, I guess, um, where the river, the Mississippi river is like the width of, you know, it's like three feet across, you know, you can barely fit your canoe or kayak through it at times. And, it's just, but it's so beautiful and pristine wilderness, but it's so funny to think about the mighty Mississippi is just, you know, essentially a a little Creek in your, like your Illinois backyard creeks, you know? Yeah. I had, it's it's uh, up close and personal. Yeah, it really is. I had a uh, black bear swim across the river uh, on my trip that I saw, which was just awesome. It was like, yeah, we were coming around a bend and uh, I was paddling with a guy met up with a guy and his son who just happened to be on the river uh, who lived in the area who were doing an overnight trip. And I paddled with them and we were coming around a bend and uh, it was near one of the campsites, which I think was called either uh, sleeping bear or bear was in the name of the campsite in, in Minnesota there. And uh, sure enough, we come around the corner and see a big black bob blob on the side and it dives like jumps right into the water and swims right across the Mississippi uh, to the other bank and up and off into the woods. I bet you won't forget about that one, huh? No, no, absolutely not. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The headwaters are beautiful. Uh, Yeah. I I love the whole river. Um, I love the way it changes. You know, every section was different. Almost every day there was something different. Um, I hear people say that the river's boring. I never felt that way. No way. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I read everything I can and I all the blogs and all the all the stuff on the uh, on Facebook and that. And that comes up every once in a while. And, you know, that's, that's how they feel about it. That's fine. That's their feeling. But not me. Um, you know, if it was, if every, you know, if it was 2,000 miles of just like the headwaters, yeah, that would, after a while, that would get boring. But it wasn't, you know, every day there's something different. And I was always, you know, it's like, what's around the next bend in the river? You know, what am I going to see next? What what will be there? What will you experience? Will you meet somebody or some wildlife or who knows what? And yeah, there were, there were some things that were pretty unusual. Uh, Unfortunately, I didn't get to see a bear like you did. That would have been great. It's funny too, isn't it? The... I don't know what your perception of the Mississippi was before you started kind of dialed being dialed in. Uh, I guess you heard the the presentation in the eighties. So you've had uh, a little bit of it, but the common, you know, perception of the Mississippi, when I talk to people, even paddlers who have ha- haven't been on it, it's just like, you know, big old ditch. Why would you want to go out there? It's polluted. There's barges. You're going to die. Uh, it's dangerous. Uh, and yet it's just so funny. It's like, that's one of my favorite places in the world. It's so wild and it's so raw, you know? Yeah. Well, I think probably, I don't even remember uh, to tell you the truth, what my perception used to be, but it was probably something like that, quite honestly. But then after hearing Byron Curtis give his presentation, I was just, uh, you know, kind of enamored with the whole idea um, and he, he really told a great story and his book really, you know, reinforced that. And then, uh, I think luckily I ran across, you know, some other people had good stories about it over the years. And then of course, Dale Sanders, and that really got me fired up, you know, uh, reading about Dale setting the record. And, and, uh, so I, I, I don't, it's been such a long time. I don't even remember way back then. when I thought <laughs> it was good. A, a dirty ditch and all polluted. Yeah. Yeah. But you do hear that. I, I certainly had that perception, uh, growing up in Illinois. Uh, you know, we never, we'd go up to Wisconsin and, uh, go to the lakes and they were clean and nice. But to think about doing a trip to the Mississippi for, you know, for what? Uh, and yeah, after I paddled it, it's just like, you know, it, yeah, it's an amazing stretch of wilderness that's just uh, 
waiting to be explored for anyone who has a boat. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's very underutilized in a lot of sections. A couple things I want to touch on, but uh, you're planning a 2024 trip on one of the other major riverways. You've done two Mississippi River trips, and now what you got up your sleeves for 2024? Going to do the Missouri. The mighty Missouri. Yep, mighty Mo. From Three Forks, Montana, all the way to St. Louis. And what's your uh, what's your plan there? You were going with a couple other guys you mentioned? Yeah. Um, uh, Matt Taylor um, from Tennessee. Uh, he's a veteran. He started a day or two after uh, Dale's group in 2022. And eventually caught up with this and uh, got to visit with him and his group. And then when they started to sort of uh, split up and go their own ways, why we recruited Matt to come and join our team. And then he finished with us. And he's just the nicest guy in the world. I think Matt's in his mid-40s. And, uh, yeah, a very strong paddler, uh, very strong, well-rounded outdoorsman. Um, uh, you know, and a veteran. So he's got a lot of, uh, fantastic background and great experience. And then, uh, a guy from Minnesota who's about my age, uh, Joe Speldrich and Joe, I think he, well, he started his trip in 2021, but because of low water, he couldn't do the whole river, every single section. So in 2022, he was out paddling some of those sections that he had to skip over. And uh, he met up with Dale and us at uh, Coon Rapids, actually, at the dam. And then he paddled through Minneapolis and on uh, down through St. Paul with us for a day or two. And then he went back home or did a different section that he wanted to catch up on. And then when we were in the lower river, uh, Joe put back on the river, I think, around St. Louis and paddled his arms off until he caught us down in uh, Venice and finished with us. Oh, wow. So he, yeah, he was one of the guys that finished with Dale on that last day. And so uh, last year, Matt said he's going to battle in Missouri this year. And I said, hey, can I go with you? And then Joe heard about it and said, hey, I want to go with you guys, too. So there's three of us. Amazing. And I think it's going to be a really good group. They're just two of the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. And how long do you anticipate this trip would take? Well, we don't know for sure, but we are planning on or allowing in our schedules for three months. And we think we can probably do it in three months, but if it takes longer, no big deal. At least not for Joe and I, because we're both retired. I'm not sure exactly uh, what Matt's got going on, but I I think he can get whatever time he needs. So we're going to definitely try to just be uh, a little bit laid back and really enjoy this trip. That's amazing. And uh, so from my understanding, the Missouri River you got uh, as compared to the Mississippi and fill me in where I'm right or wrong or fill in the gaps uh, is – I mean, similar in length, similar in, uh, you know, width and, and, uh, uh, maybe it's more remote, but the bigger challenge is that, uh, you have lots of those dams, uh, and lots of huge, massive reservoirs in the Dakotas and, and all over that, uh, that you lose your current and the wind out there. I lived in South Dakota for, uh, three or four years and, the wind out there, man, you think it's windy in, in uh, Pontiac <laughs> and DeKalb, Illinois. It is a different game out there. All right. Well, I haven't spent a lot of time out there. I've never been to Montana. I don't think the three of us, we, I don't think any of us have ever even been into Montana before. So, funny. yeah, it's going to be a, a learning process, I'm sure, in a lot of ways. The, one of the first things when you go on the Missouri River Paddlers uh, website it says this isn't the Mississippi. <laughs> so that, that, you know, is it okay? 
you know, we're probably going to kind of be in for it here, but uh, <laughs> we're, all, we're all game. And we do understand the reservoirs are, are massive. I think I added it up and it's, uh, it's, I know it's over 800 miles of reservoirs and lakes. Mm. It's uh, just about a third of the entire trip. So that's a big, big difference from the Mississippi. And then like you're saying, uh, you know, it's probably going to be even more wind than on the Mississippi. Uh, that's what I'm hearing from everybody. So I'm sure that's true. Uh, and more and rural. I, yeah, yeah, more remote for sure, way out in the yeah. middle of nowhere for hundreds of miles at a time. Um, so it'll be interesting, should be fun. Some of the scenery I've seen pictures, it's it's spectacular. So oh, yeah, yeah. So I uh, I lived in South Dakota and did uh, many trips uh, on the Missouri um, near Yankton, South Dakota and, uh, different sections, the Fort Randall dam, I believe. I can't remember if that was our put in or take out. And then I lived in Montana as well in Bozeman, Montana for a few years and, uh, paddled the headwaters where you, where you will start many a time, um, the Jefferson and the Madison and the Gallatin, and then the, the forming of the Missouri too. And funny enough, uh, when I was in Montana, uh, I had paddled, you know, I had already paddled the Mississippi and the Yukon previously. And so I was pretty dialed into the, uh, like the through paddling scene. And there was a guy who uh, was lived, lived outside of Bozeman and they did a dugout canoe. I don't know if you've heard of him, uh, yeah. but they, they had a dugout canoe. <laughs> they made a massive log, cleared it out and, paddled the Mississippi river or the Missouri river. Amazing. And so I was following along and they had a, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, a send off, I guess, like anybody could come and paddle with them on their first day, uh, as they started. And so I had got a couple buddies and we went out and, uh, paddled with them on their first day and it was a blast and a lot of fun and, and fun following their journey. But, it was interesting, like you said, uh, a lot of the guys, the, this, this group in particular, and they were doing it in a unique way. They were, uh, you know, the guy who kind of spearheaded, it, I should get him on the podcast, real interesting guy, but he's big into edible plants and, uh, you know, I don't know what the right term is, I guess, hunter gatherer type of, uh, living off of land. And he's doing, yeah. And he's doing it in a dugout canoe. Um, but so they all convene on the first day and none of them know, know each other at all. And <laughs> I, I could already tell when I stepped in, I was like, there's going to, this is going to be interesting to follow just because there were some different personalities and, uh, I, I, they finished and it was great, but I think they dropped and picked up a couple along the way, but as to be expected, but, uh, it's pretty part of the country up there, I guess all that to say, <laughs> Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. We're getting more and more excited as every day passes. A um, couple more things, then I'll wind her down here. But uh, how about the difference between the... Uh, I saw on your website doing a, a, a browse, and you do a great blog. It's... Uh, let's see if I have the if I have it here. danofaust.wordpress.com. Um the difference between the Afafalacha and the main channel of the Mississippi. So there's two routes, two options to finish on the Mississippi, uh, going through yeah. New Orleans along the main channel and out through the, the South Pass generally uh, to Venice and south of that into the Gulf. And then there's an offshoot that some people take as well, most people, I think, uh, called the Afafalacha, and it kicks you off of the uh, 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 north of New Orleans. I'm not sure where it is, north of Baton Rouge maybe, um, and kicks you off onto a smaller channel. They say the uh, original or what what would the Mississippi River would flow to that channel naturally if it wasn't uh, yes. uh, managed so well. Um, so that's kind of a, a this or that in the Mississippi River yeah. community. What, what, uh, what's your perception on both of those routes? Well, yeah, I, I got to do both of them. My first year by myself, I, I took the Chafalaya because that's the way Byron Curtis did it. And, you know, he was my inspiration originally. And uh, 
And, uh, you know, I think I, I thought about changing that. You know, I didn't have to do exactly what Byron did. I wasn't trying to uh, duplicate his trip. But for, for me, the big advantage on the Atchafalaya was that my family could drive right up to a boat ramp. I'd paddle right up to the ramp, pull my boat out, load it on the car, and we'd drive back home. So it was very, very convenient. Um, it, when you follow the Mississippi Channel all the way down through uh, Baton Rouge, New Orleans, Venice, and then out to the Gulf, you get out there in the middle of nowhere. And unless you've uh, rented a boat um, and you got somebody coming out there to be with you, you get out there and you're all by yourself. And then you either have to paddle back about 20 miles upstream or you have to hire a boat to haul you back. Um, so I'd already kind of planned to do the Atchafalaya before I really knew what was involved. And it just worked out so good. Um, by the time we got really into the planning, we stuck with that because my family wanted to come down and be a part of it. And they did. They uh, rented, chartered a boat uh, for the last day and they were out there on the water to to see me finish the trip and, and uh, finish up. So that was pretty exciting. That's so awesome. that worked out really, really well. I will admit, though, when I got there to, uh, I think it's called Shreve's Bar, is an island um, right next to the old lock where you cross over onto the, uh, the Atchafalaya. Um, and I, I camped there the, the night before. And I had some second thoughts, you know, it's like, wow, I'm leaving the Mississippi after, you know, all this time on this river, I'm not going to see the rest of it. I'm not going to finish it. In the Atchafalaya, I, I'd read all the descriptions and everything, and it's pretty much what they say. It's uh, much smaller, less barge traffic. There is some barge traffic, a lot more wildlife. You're back to... Uh, a more natural waterway, less uh, wing dams and things. You know, on the, on the Mississippi down south, it's so huge. And the wing dams are so big and reach out so far that you're paddling out there in the middle of a big, big wide river. And so you're not anywhere near shore. You don't see the animals and you don't even see many birds or anything. You're just out there in, a, in a, the middle of this big, big river. Uh, then when you go over to the Atchafalaya, I mean, I, I wasn't even on the Atchafalaya yet. I was on the channel leading out to the Atchafalaya, which is a, a mile or so. And I saw my first alligator. That's where I f saw my first alligator. Because, you know, down there, they might have been on the Mississippi. They might have had alligators down there. They probably did. But I was out in the middle of the river, out in the middle of the channel all the time. I, I didn't see any of them. I didn't encounter that. So... Um, the Atchafalaya still had a good flow, a good current, helped me ride along. It was pretty easy paddling. It's very pretty. You're in a freshwater swamp, one of the biggest freshwater swamps in the world, biggest one in the United States, I believe. And, uh, you know, it, it was, it was good and it was very convenient. Cut like, I don't know, 150 miles or so, 175 miles off the trip. So it's, it's a nice way if that's what you want to do. It's kind of like eventually I went, the last little part, you go through Hog Bayou, at least that's the way I went, to get out to Burns Point State Park where I finished. And it was, uh, you know, it's a different environment, alligators and stuff, but it uh, a small, intimate stream, very twisty, turny, very lush. Uh, it reminded me of the opposite of the headwaters. You know, I, I started out in a little stream like that with a really, you know, abundant wildlife and it's right there. And that's how it finished too. So it was kind of a nice, nice way to finish almost like you started. Right. Um, the second year going down through on the, staying on the main Mississippi river channel, Baton Rouge, New Orleans and on down, I'd heard all this, Talk about how dangerous it would be, these big ocean-going ships, many, many more barges, uh, barges parked along the riverbank for miles and miles at a time. And all that was true. 
but it wasn't nearly as intimidating or as dangerous as I had anticipated. The river is really big down there, and uh, we had lots of room to move around. We could avoid all the barges and the big ships. Uh, It's very industrial. There were miles and miles and miles where you couldn't get to shore because it was just lined with these parked barges, um, fleeted, fleeted barges, I guess is what they say. Um, actually, St. Louis was a more intimidating to me going I through agree. St. Louis than going through uh, either Baton Rouge or New Orleans. I, I, uh, I found both of them uh to be a little, uh, a little pucker factor going. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can understand that. I mean, there's no way I could possibly describe so that someone could understand just how big those ships are, those cargo ships. And, uh, you know, you talk about feeling really, really small. Yeah. And we, I didn't get anywhere near any of those ships. And I still felt tiny, like an ant out there. Uh, they are they're huge. And they throw up, some of them can throw up a pretty good wake. Uh, luckily, there they weren't any breaking waves or anything, uh, mostly big rollers. Um, those can kind of be fun and intimidating both. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I had an advantage, too. I was with uh, Dale and Matt, and those guys are – Really, really good outdoorsman. Uh, Matt Briggs loves that area. Him and his dad go fishing down there. They've done it his whole life. He knows that area really well. So we we had good camp spots and everything because they, they know all the good camping spots down there. Um, sometimes it can, I, I could understand it. Uh, the good camping spots are a lot fewer and farther between than on the river north of there. Um so, you know, all the things I, I read about the main channel going all the way out, again, through uh, New Orleans and all that, it, it was all accurate and true, but it just wasn't quite as bad as what I think I had worked it up to be in my head. Sure. So hmm. um, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed both of them. I'm glad I got to do both trips. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I would be too. I, I hope to do it. Uh, <clears throat> I hope to do it again someday as well, for sure. Um, so it's funny. I talk to people uh, from all over the world, really. I've been doing this now uh, over three years coming up. Uh, yeah, over three years. And for some reason, I always seem to, uh, you don't think there's anyone around. And then all of a sudden I get all these Midwest people uh, I talked to a lot of people from Illinois. Uh, uh, just the guy I had on the other day it was one of the episodes that you had mentioned uh, that you listened to was was from Illinois. And it's funny how, you know, you're you're as far as the world goes, you're right down the road from me. Um, yep. And but anyway, I really also enjoy doing all of the little creeks and all of the rivers uh, in Illinois and southern Wisconsin and uh, the river that you're on there and near Pontiac, Illinois. Uh, the Vermilion is beautiful. I've had one of my best, uh, fishing days, uh, from the canoe at, for out of a while, uh, on the Vermilion, uh, just hammering small mouth and, uh, the rapids are fun and lots of great fish, but, uh, I, there's a canoe in my fleet right now and I hope I'm not outing myself to you. Um, that I found on the Vermilion river, uh, near, I forget the put in and take out that we were at. I think it's near Streeter, Illinois, maybe. Okay. And, uh, I was paddling with my buddy and, uh, we're rounding the corner and my buddy who I'm fishing with is like, uh, uh, he's great and he's the best. And, but he is always dialed in river. Uh, he's a fishing guide and a river bum, uh, and river rat like me and he's always dialed into river booty so like Mm -hmm. things that wash up on the shore um so he's always finding fishing lures fishing tackle uh you name it most of the stuff uh i he tries to bring in the boat and i'm like come on really i mean i pick it up because it's trash but you don't want to bring that home do you and he's like oh yeah yeah um i was like my kind of guy yeah exactly he finds everything it's crazy 
And so we're rounding the corner and there's a massive uh, log jam, like massive, massive. I don't know how big it was, but it was tall log jam on one of the uh, bridges on the Vermilion. And we come along and he's like, I think that's a canoe up there. This little spot of green hanging out in the log jam. And I'm like, huh, I think you're right. And we've seen multiple, you know, boats torn apart uh, on, on all of our river travel. So I didn't think much of it, but. So you get my canoe. Is it yours? No. Okay, good. <laughs> I was kind of hoping it was. I've never uh, had a green canoe, but. Uh, it's funny. But yeah, we climbed up on this log jam and like unburied it on the vermilion and were able to haul it haul it down and then we tied it to the back and uh it was in great condition and still in my uh in my fleet that i run with right now <laughs> wait yeah that's the best yeah uh, hard to beat free, I, did, right? I did lose a kayak one time i was out oh. paddling in a flood and i shouldn't have been out there and uh and and i lost it and uh there's a red uh, dagger response. So if you ever find that one, let me know. Yeah, okay. I'll let you know. I also, <laughs> actually, I think it's gone by now. I, I was living in, uh, I went to, uh, college in Colorado and I was living in Colorado and I was paddling with a buddy in Colorado, uh, outside of Boulder on the St. Vrain river. And, uh, we flipped and I think this is the only time that I've wrapped a canoe and uh we wrapped it on a strainer that was out in the in the kind of in the middle of the river we had like a maybe like a five foot gap in order to hit and we started too low in the water to get our eddy turn in line and ate it and we had to ended up uh hiking out and having to hitchhike back into town couldn't get it out we were trying and uh just uh, for two reasons. One, because I'm always cruising Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist for canoes because I'm always looking for a, a good canoe deal, you know? Um, and two, just because I was kind of always interested, but I was searching. This, I think, was like two or three years later, maybe even more, because I had moved and I was in South Dakota at the time. And I was looking and I found an ad on Craigslist for a canoe wrapped in the St. Frayne River. And I was like, I'll be damned. <laughs> and I had a buddy who was living, still living in Boulder at the time. I called him. And I was like, Hey man, go, go check this canoe out. See if it's salvageable, if it's worth saving. Um, and he went, looked at it, called me and he was like, dude, not worth it. The lady wants, to, <laughs> the lady wants to repair it. You should just give it to her. I was like, perfect. But I was, I was glad to hear the story. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty wild. Funny, funny. Um, Dan, what, what is, uh, we'll, we'll wind her down here. What has been, uh, your, your takeaways from your long distance canoe trips, uh, on the mighty Mississippi and other rivers and, and your, your canoeing and, and kayaking and camping throughout your life? What, what, what's been your takeaway? I guess that's a big question, but maybe just with the big trips. Yeah. One of the things I like, um, about just being on camping trip or you get out there on a river in the middle of nowhere, you can really, you know, kind of get away from everything. First of all, um, um, you know, I want to get too religious or anything, but that's for me personally, I'm kind of a spiritual person, not a real big religious person. And I feel closer to God when I'm in the outdoors. Um, but besides that, I think you can kind of, uh, reset you know you, you can you get out on in the middle of nowhere and you know food and shelter and you know those, the basic necessities of life those are the things you concentrate on and it uh you, you figure out what's important you know it's not to me it's not you know what's the baseball team doing or what's going on on you know, social media or whatever it happens to be all the distractions we have in life, those things aren't important. Um, and really at the bottom line, what it comes down to is, is the people in your life, the people you care about, your family. And uh, it seems to me that, you know, that's the thing that always sort of being outdoors and being on a on trip like that, that's what it brings out is how important that 
people are in your life and the people you meet along the way and the relationships you have and the friends you make. And uh, so that's the most rewarding thing. And then beyond that, it's just, I enjoy it. I, I it makes me happy. Um, uh, helps me de-stress. Um, that was one of the big reasons I, I paddled when I was younger. Uh, I needed to uh, just have a, like an escape from all the regular stresses of work and daily life and things like that. So it's a great way to do that and come to find out, you know, it's, uh, it's healthy. There's a lot of health benefits. It does de-stress you just going for a, a walk for 20 minutes in the outdoors, um, sitting next to a stream, um, listening to the sounds of nature, all kinds of things. It's and best. it's been documented. Um, and, uh, People have made me aware of that now. So it's uh, it's not just that's what I think. This people, really smart people, have said, yeah, this is a it's a real thing. So uh, yeah, I think it's great, and I encourage other people to do it. They take I, anything away from some of my trips and hearing about it and listening to me talk about it. I hope that's that would be their takeaway that the just it'll it'll benefit you just to spend a little time outdoors. You definitely don't have to go on a 2,000 mile canoe or kayak trip. You just, you know, 20 minutes, a half an hour, whatever you can spare, whatever you can get out of your week, just go out and de-stress a little bit and enjoy it. Enjoy nature. Amen. I think that was, uh, that was perfectly said. Um, Dan, uh, the movie is called Graybeard Myth, the Man, the Mississippi, right? Yeah. Graybeard, the Man, the Myth, the Mississippi. And your uh, website, your blog, where people can find, uh, read about your past Mississippi trips. Are you going to do some stuff for the uh, uh, Missouri trip this summer, upcoming summer in 2024 on there? Yep. I'm going to continue to blog. I really enjoyed that. I uh, wish I had done it earlier in my life. Um, I go back and I, I read back through that stuff all the time. Just uh, the last day or so, somebody was asking about the Illinois River. And I did a little trip on the Illinois River, getting ready for the Mississippi. Uh, it was about three or four days. And I went back and I reread that. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun for me. It's very enjoyable. It's almost like I'm back out on the on the river again. Um, there's so many little details. And, of course, the photographs and everything are great. But to put down your thoughts and your feelings and what was going on and what your experiences were, um, it's, it's just a... a another beneficial thing you can do on a trip like that. I don't uh, keep a diary. I don't keep a log or anything in my daily life, but uh, doing it on these, on these trips, uh, it's therapeutic if nothing else. And uh, a lot of, a lot of benefits, just like there is to being in the outdoors. There's a lot of extra benefits that you don't even realize. So I'm definitely going to do it this, this summer. Great. Uh, Yeah. Well, I'll be, I'll be following along and uh, best of luck and uh, yeah, we'll have to stay in touch and uh, looking forward to following along the uh, Missouri River adventure. Thanks, Will. I really appreciate it. And there you have it. That is Dan Faust on episode 84 of Buffalo Romer Outdoors, the film that we mentioned uh, several times called Greybeard, the myth, the man, the Mississippi. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. Don't forget... 2024 Buffalo Roamer guided canoe trips are out. Dates are out at buffaloroamer.com. Really excited about the Mississippi River trip we've got going this year. That's July 26th through the 29th in La Crosse, Wisconsin, near La Crosse, Wisconsin. On the mighty Mississippi, we'll be paddling the main channel and the back channels, uh, beautiful rolling hills. We'll go through a state park, uh, two national or uh, two wildlife refuges. One of them is national, one of them's state of Wisconsin. Uh, and it's really just a beautiful area and it'll be a great trip. So check that out at buffaloroamer.com backslash trips. Also have have uh, several other fully guided and outfitted canoe trips listed there as well. Uh, thank you to SRE Outdoors and SREgear.com. Thank you to Fischel Paddles, makers of fine handcrafted wooden canoe paddles. That's about it. Go outside, get some fresh air. Hope you enjoyed the podcast. We'll talk to you next time.